What's happening? How we doing? Awesome. I've got a book at my house. I've got a lot of books at my house. It's probably something I should give up to give. I've got a lot of books at the house. One of them is my daughter's, and it's called Bedtime Stories. It's a collection of kind of classic bedtime stories, right? So we got Henny Penny and, and, and uh, what's the other one? Little Red Hen, right? And I kind of wish they were sequels. They're, they're unrelated. Um, we've got Cinderella. We've got Snow White. We've got Rumpelstiltskin. Uh, my daughter's kind of obsessed with Cinderella right now. But all of these stories don't, uh, are unconnected. They're unrelated. As much as I would love for Little Red Hen to be the sequel to Henny Penny, it's not. Uh, they're, they're unrelated. It's just this anthology of stories, right? And you probably have some of these in your house too. And I think that sometimes we look at the Bible as sort of a similar anthology or collection of stories. And I don't know if it's the way that we were brought up in church. Like you went to Sunday school one week and you got David and Goliath. You went the next week, you got Daniel and the lion's den. The next week, Jesus was feeding the 5,000. Like you just kind of, it kind of comes in as episodes, right? But unconnected episodes that seem to be unrelated to the rest, right? That's the way we view the Bible. We don't think that the Bible has a story arc because it's not presented to us that way. And so this week, we're going to be wrapping up our What is the Bible? And, and to wrap it up, I want to show, show you. Ooh, show you. Woo. Oh, what was that? I want to show you in a manly voice uh, the story arc of the Bible. And I want to show you it in four acts. And we're going to look at it in a way that is probably different than any sermon that we've done here in a while, um, which makes me excited and a little nervous, clearly, because my voice. But we're going to have fun with it, and, and I think you'll really see the, the movements of Scripture, and I think it'll help you as you study the Bible this year with us. So we're going to start in Genesis 1, uh, because that's where all good stories start in the beginning, right? Uh, and, but we're going to, our text for today is the entire Bible, so I hope you packed a lunch. We're going to be here for a while. So act one. We're in act one, which is God creates. God creates. Verse 26 of Genesis chapter one. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life. I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. Let's stop there. So you probably remember Genesis 1 from our beginning series, Genesis, uh, talking about the book of Genesis. But like every good story, it starts in, in sort of a, a stable or, or idyllic time, right? So God creates this perfect kingdom. It's called Eden. And he's going to rule this kingdom, but he's not going to rule it directly. He's going to rule through people that he's made. He's essentially ruling through his son and a daughter, or sort of, which is his, his princes, his viceroys. The, the, these are people who are going to rule on his behalf, right? That's who, how he's going to rule this creation. Now, he could rule it directly, but he chooses to rule through them, and he gives them everything that they need. Look again at verse 29. And God said, behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. They've given, he's given them the tools they need to do it. He's also given them responsibility. You're supposed to rule this on my behalf, not on your own. So you're not doing this for you, you're doing this for me. You answer to me, and there's rules and restrictions about that, essentially not to eat from a certain tree in the garden. And all of this is very good. God makes the perfect kingdom. It kind of starts out like fairy tales that we read today, right? Once upon a time, there was a king who had a perfect kingdom, and he had a son and a daughter in this perfect kingdom. Again, Adam and Eve are not divine, but they are ruling on his behalf, right? And this is the act one story of the Bible. Creation. You meet the characters. You engage with them. And and it's it's like a lot of act ones that you see in modern day movies and modern day uh, books that you read, right? 
In Act 1, you're introduced to the characters, you get to know them, and you get to know the world that they live in, right? So in episode, in Star Wars, the first Star Wars, A New Hope, the 177, you meet all of the characters. You meet Luke, you meet Leia, you meet Obi-Wan, you meet Darth Vader, and you understand without much exposition at all that Darth Vader is the bad guy and that you're supposed to root for the girl with the cinnamon rolls on the side of her head. <laughs> like it's really easy because we're used to it. We know this story. The setting's a little different, but we know it, right? All comes together. Marvel's done this a little differently with the Marvel Avengers movies. They've taken individual movies to introduce you to the characters, right? But it's still the same thing. They call everything leading up to the first Avengers movie phase one. Guess what? That's a cute way of saying it's act one. You met Iron Man, you met the Hulk, you met Thor, you met Captain America. End of act one is Avengers. And at the end of Avengers, who do you meet? Thanos, who nobody knew, unless you're a comic book person, Nobody knew who he was, but now everybody's like, oh, Thanos, I know him. He's purple. I know that guy. The end of Act 1, you meet all the characters. You know who the players are. That's Act 1. But you also enter into a world that they live in, right? In Star Wars, we go to a galaxy a long time ago and far, far away, right? The Avengers movies, it's our world, but with superheroes in it. It's really simple. And that's exactly what you get in Genesis 1 and 2. You meet the characters. You meet the protagonist. Who's the protagonist of the Bible? God. God's the protagonist, not the antagonist. The antagonist is not... Whoa, you scared me there for a minute. Who's the protagonist? Satan. What? No. No. Very wrong. The main character of our story is God. You meet him. And you meet other major characters. You meet Adam and Eve, right? They're major players. And in them, I see myself, right? I see them. And you meet their perfect world, their kingdom, the Garden of Eden, and that seems very familiar to me. Garden of Eden sounds a lot like what I experience. There's humans, there's animals. It's a little different, right? It's perfect, it's sinless. People are naked. It's a little weird. But for the most part, I can identify with the world that's being put forth to me, right? That's because Act 1, that's because the Bible, that's what makes the Bible so relevant and pertinent. I can see myself in the story. I don't have to imagine being Adam. I, I, I am Adam. I get it. I connect with him. I see it. And what's weird is you have a lot of act ones in your life. You have a lot of creation narratives in your life, right? Well, one, you're born and you enter into the story. You meet your major characters. You meet mom and dad, you meet brothers and sisters, boom, you're born. But it goes even further than that, right? You might start at a new job. And it's going to be perfect. Oh, you're just so excited about this new job. It's going to be perfect. It's going to be great. The boss seems cool. The coworkers seem cool. You're finally going to get to do that thing that you studied for. It's going to be great. Or you meet somebody new and you're dating, right? And for the first like two months, oh my gosh, they're perfect for me. And you think they're perfect for you. And they think you're perfect for them. And the only people who are really disgusted are your friends who have to hear about it. <laughs> or you get married, right? And you get married and it's a perfect day, the wedding, oh, it's so beautiful, we're, we're princesses in our kingdom, and it's precious. And then we go on an idyllic honeymoon, a foreign destination, it's great. Or you have this new baby, right? Oh, look how perfect he is or she is. Perfect, we use that word a lot, perfect. Even retirement can be kind of a new beginning, right? You're like, man, I'm super excited. I'm finally going to get to take up that hobby that I've always wanted to take up, but I haven't had time for. You experience act one in your life a lot. And we have similar feels about it that we have about Genesis 1 and 2. It seems hopeful, exciting, perfect, idyllic. But we've also lived long enough to know that perfect maybe doesn't last that long. That's because there's act two. Act two, which is creation rebels. Turn over to chapter 3, verse 6. So in Act 2, you open up with meeting a new character. It's this serpent. And the serpent shows up and starts tempting Adam and Eve. And what does this mean? Well, well, basically, he starts calling into question the goodness of the main character, the goodness of God, the wisdom of God. Did God really say that you can have every plant for food? Oh, well, well, well. yeah, he said that, but we're not supposed to touch and eat this one tree in the middle of the garden or we're going to die. And he says, oh, you're not going to die. It's okay. You're fine. See, he knows that if you eat of it, you're going to be like him. So if you eat of it, you can, you can take from him his throne. You can take his kingdom. And rather than ruling on behalf and bearing his image, you can bear your own image. 
You can be the man. You can be the woman. You can be in charge. And what do they do? We'll look at verse 6 of chapter 3. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The certain deceive, serpent deceived me, and I ate. There's huge ramifications for this act of rebellion, right? First thing we see is that they notice the other person's naked, which we talked about this a few weeks ago. That's a, that's a semblance of vulnerability. They recognize that they're, they're exposed, they're vulnerable to the other person, so they cover up with fig leaves, right? And then they realize they've got to hide from God and that one leaf is not going to do the job, so they go and hide amongst the trees to hide from God. And God says, where are you? Where'd you go? Why are you hiding? Why are you naked? And then what do they start doing? They start blaming, right? Adam blames God and blames the woman. The woman blames the serpent. And all these things the rest of the chapter enter into the story. There's evil, there's bad things, there's sin, there's brokenness, there's hurt, there's anguish, there's curses, there's punishment. All right? Now there's shame. They're ashamed of themselves. They're ashamed of one another. There's pain and frustration, right? The woman's going to have pain in childbirth. The woman is going to desire to rule over her husband and there'll be strife between the genders. We experience that even today. The man, the ground is going to be cursed because of the man's sin. It means work sometimes isn't fun. Work is toilsome and a burden, and we don't like it sometimes. And it all seems very, very hopeless. See, Act 2 is the hardest one to watch. You know why Act 2 is bad? Why it's hard? It's not because one bad thing's happened, and and then we just got to fix the one bad thing. If you watch a movie, notice all the things that go wrong in Act 2. It's like one after another, after another, after another. Things get worse and worse. And that's Genesis 3 through 11. There's some glimmers of hope in there, but for the most part, things get worse. What's the very next thing that happens in Genesis chapter 4? Adam and Eve have a son and another son, and then what happens? Cain kills Abel. So now we've gone to murder. And then you have Genesis 5, then you have Genesis 6, and you meet a guy named Noah, and the violence is so bad in the world that God finally decides enough is enough, and he destroys the earth, except for Noah and his family. And then after the story of Noah, there's this Tower of Babel, so you have creation rebelling yet again, and things get worse and worse and worse. And we wonder, how are the heroes going to fix this? How are our heroes going to fix this? Things get worse and worse and worse. It happens in The Empire Strikes Back, right? You have the the rebels lose the Battle of Hoth, and yes, I know it's Hoth. It's not the ice world. It's Hoth, okay? And they, they, they flee the area. They're running away. Luke goes to train on Dagobah with Yoda. Han and, and Leia go to Cloud City, and they meet Lando, and they're betrayed. C-3PO's blown into bits, which I think was a service. And then they're... They're, Han's captured, he's put into carbonite and frozen, he's given to the bounty hunter, Luke gets his hand chopped off, and spoiler alert, Darth Vader is his dad? What? It's all worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. Harry Potter, I know we're Baptists, we're not supposed to talk about it, but it's fine. We've come very far. So spoiler alert here, if you haven't read or seen the movies, which again, I don't know how you haven't, but books four through six, that's act two. In book four, Voldemort comes back and he kills Cedric. And you're like, oh, that's bad. Then it gets worse. He raises up all the Death Eaters, right? And they, they, uh, they kill Sirius Black. That's bad still. And then book six, at the end of book six, again, spoilers, Dumbledore's killed. You're like, could this get any worse? No. The Avengers movies, right? We have the, the Civil War movie and everybody breaks apart. They're no longer the Avengers. What's going to happen? And that's what chapters 4 through 11 of the Bible are like. It's like things just keep getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And you're like, what is, what's God going to do to fix this? How's it? It just doesn't seem very hopeful. 
And it's probably not hard to see this in your own life. Right? That perfect job that you got, you show up to day one, and you realize that boss that was really nice in the interview is a total jerk. And then a couple weeks later, they come to you and they're like, hey, we know we hired you for this, but this person just quit, and so we're going to actually transfer you to this department. And the department you're going to is the, the, the same thing you were doing at the old job you left and that you hated. And so now you're doing this thing again. And you're like, God, this is just the worst. Or that person that you started dating that you really loved before, all of a sudden does something, you're like, oh, man, I don't know about this. It's like a red flag, like they chew their food really loudly. That's a red flag for me, I'm sorry. <laughs> Make not a noise when they eat, or, or they say something, you're like, I don't know. If, and you have to decide, am I going to love this person, warts it all, or am I just going to cut it off? Or that idyllic marriage that you had, right? You, you, you come back from the, the perfect honeymoon, and you guys have all these Ikea gift cards, right? So you're like, oh, let's go to Ikea, where relationships go to die. <laughs> I, you know how Paris has the, the chain link fence that you can put the locks on for all the, the sweet romantic couples? I think Ikea should have like a, a, a graveyard outside for relationships that end in their store. So you go into Ikea and you start buying stuff for your new home, and by the time you leave, you just want to choke the person to death with the Swedish meatballs balls that you got for like two bucks inside of Ikea. It's not perfect. You kind of hate each other. And you realize marriage is tough. It's difficult. Or that perfect little baby boy or baby girl you had grows up and there's rebellion. They call you things that you've never called anybody in your life. And you're like, why would you say that? I mean, I'm your parent. I love you. And so you try to exert more control over them and they rebel even more. And they grow up and they go to college or they don't go to college and that's further disappointment for you, whatever it is. And you just... How did it get to be like this? Or retirement stops seeming really great after about a month and it stops seeing like one long vacation and you realize that your entire identity was tied up in what you did for a living and you don't know what to do. And that's act two, the fall. Nothing works, everything's broken. But praise God, he does not leave us in act two because he moves us into act three. Act three. God redeems. Turn with me to Romans chapter 4. Yeah, we're skipping a lot. Just grab a chunk and start turning. Romans chapter 4. The reason why we're going to Romans 4 is Paul does a really great job of summarizing the Old Testament in a lot of places. I picked Romans 4. God starts the plan of redemption. He actually starts it in Act 2. It's in Genesis 3.17. He tells the woman that there will be born of her a someone, a son, who will crush the head of the serpent. What this means is, what we believe it means, is that there's going to come someone who's going to reverse the curse, reverse the sin, reverse death, overthrow evil, and is going to restore the kingdom to its rightful place. It's going to restore the kingdom back to God, and everything's going to be okay again. So throughout Scripture, we're looking for this Messiah. We're looking for this person who is coming, right? God is putting his plan of redemption in place. And so we pick it up in Genesis 12. And in Genesis 12, you meet a guy named Abram. And God promises a bunch of things to Abram. Let's look in Romans 4, 13. For the promise to Abraham, that's Abram as well, and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Wow, that's a lot right there. You covered a lot of Old Testament history. So God makes this covenant. He makes an agreement with Abraham in Genesis 12. He says, you're going to be my guy. I'm going to bless you. And through you, I'm going to bless everybody else. You're going to be the father of many nations, and I'm going to give you land. And so the story of the Old Testament revolves around these concepts of land, of of the father of of, of nations being born out of Abraham's line, and, and all this stuff. And how is God going to fulfill this promise to Abraham? And that question still presents itself in the New Testament. That's why Paul's talking about it in Romans. We'll do a whole series on Romans in the summer as our year of the Bible study continues. So don't worry, we're going to talk about it. So we meet Abraham. At this point, Abraham is old and he doesn't have any children. And God says, you're going to have a son. And so he has a son. His son's name's Isaac. And then Isaac has a son named Jacob and Esau. And Jacob is the one through whom the line continues. Jacob has 12 sons and they all go down to Egypt. And that's the end of the book of Genesis, right? Now, in Egypt, they continue to have children, they grow, and they become a full-on people group, like they have a cultural identity, and Egypt gets scared and enslaves them. And after about 400 years, God says, you know what, I think I'm going to pull my people out of Egypt now. And so he gets Moses, and Moses, through the power of God, leads the Israelites out of Egypt, 
And they wind up on their way to the promised land, which is where we are in our year of the Bible reading. And man, it seems like 40 years. We've been wandering in that desert with them. It's long. It's long. We're in Deuteronomy, though. We're going to make it. And so, uh, so God brings them into the land. They conquer the land. And then he puts over them a king named David. And he makes some promises and some agreements with David. And so you have this great kingdom. It seems like the plan is really in motion. Things are moving forward. But the thing with Act 3 and the thing with the Old Testament is that there's kind of these half measures that take place, right? So our heroes take a couple steps forward. They take a step back or they take two steps back, right? There's this cycle of obedience and disobedience in the Old Testament. You see it in Joshua. You see it in Judges. You see it in, in Kings. You see it in the Prophets. If the, if the Israelites have a good king or a good leader, typically they do okay. But if they don't, they fall into idolatry, they fall into rebellion, and they just go Genesis 3 all over again. And so finally God says, enough's enough. I'm taking you out of the land, which is a big deal. Remember, the land is something that's promised. I'm taking you out of the land. You're going to go into exile. Assyria's taken ten tribes out, and Babylon's taken the other two. And at the end of the Old Testament, when we get to Malachi, we get there and we're all looking at each other and being like, man, this is kind of a shell of what it was supposed to be. I mean, the Israelites are back in the land after the exile, but the temple that they're worshiping in is a rinky-dink temple compared to Solomon's temple. It's not very good. They don't have their own country. They don't even have their own king. They're still ruled by Persia, which took the place of Babylon. And then the Greeks are going to come in, and then the Romans are going to come in, and we're all kind of looking at each other at the end of the Old Testament and being like, that's really what God had in mind? Where's this Messiah? Where's this person supposed to come who's going to heal everything, going to take care of everything? And that's what Abraham, what Paul's talking about here in verse 13, for the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Then in 14, for if it's the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That's why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So if we are people of faith, Abraham is our father. Again, the father of many nations. We'll talk about that. As it is written, I've made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Do you hear that? life to the dead, and calls into existence things that do not exist. It's a creation reference. Paul's reaching back all the way to Genesis and pulling this, remember, hey, remember the protagonist of the story, remember the main character. He's the creator and he's the redeemer. Here he comes. Verse 18, in becoming, sorry, in hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old. And when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. Okay, so one of the elements of Act 3 is that even though in Act 2 things have gotten worse and worse, our heroes have concocted a plan, and they usually get to a point, a critical moment, when everything's supposed to work out, right? And then something goes wrong. They get betrayed. So like somebody they thought was on their team all along has actually ratted them out to the villain. Or the villain has secretly known about the plot all the time, and so things have gotten wrong. So, all, so you get to this critical moment in Act 3 where the heroes are supposed to win, and then it looks like they're about to lose, and you're like, oh my gosh, everything's, and, and we all know the story because we're all like, I'm not worried about this. Something's going to happen. And what happens is it's called the unlooked for hope. It's the unexpected rescue, right? So we get to the end of the Old Testament and we're waiting for that unexpected rescue. The, plan, the plan's not gone great and, and, and we're waiting on this hero to come, this, this unexpected person to come up. And we find him in Verse 23, but the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for hers, his also, for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead, Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Jesus is the unlooked for hope. Well, well Travis, why is he the unlooked for hope? What nobody saw coming and why they killed him is because nobody saw God entering the story as a human being to rescue everybody. 
Nobody saw that coming. It's in the prophets. We see it. It points to it, but we can look back and see it. But those writing at the time didn't, know, like, didn't see it. And certainly the people of the Pharisees didn't get it at the time. That's why they kill Jesus. They don't kill Jesus because he's nice and he's doing miracles. They kill Jesus because he claims to be God. And he proves that he is. Right? So every story in the Old Testament points us to this unlooked for hope, this character, this person who's going to come, right? So the, 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 the characters and the stories you love, David and Goliath, Daniel and the lion's den, guess what? Points you to Jesus Christ. We don't have time to tell you how, but they do. But then the weird stories that we read like this week, Balaam's donkey a couple weeks ago, right? That's a weird story. It points you to Jesus. Ezekiel. Ezekiel, guess what he gets called numerous times in his book? God calls him son of man. Son of man, son of man. Well, that sounds vaguely familiar because that's what Jesus calls himself all the time. The book of Zechariah, which is basically one big acid trip, (laughs) points you to Jesus Christ. All roads point you to Christ in Scripture, to this main character who's going to come and rescue us. It's vintage Act 3. It's vintage Act 3. You have someone who shows up who wasn't expected, right? So in Return of the Jedi, we're kind of towards the end of the movie. The emperor has revealed that he knew all along that the rebels were going to come and try to destroy the second Death Star. Luke is being like shocked by all this lightning, the force lightning's on him. Luke and Leia, or Han and Leia, are kind of captured on, on Endor. And what happens Darth Vader picks up the Emperor and chucks him down a power reactor. What? He's the unlooked for hope. What? I thought Darth Vader was the bad guy. No. He's been redeemed. He's been rescued. And that's the unlooked for hope. In Harry Potter, again, spoilers. I just don't want to ruin a book for like a 10-year-old, okay? In Harry Potter, he's, he's dead. Voldemort kills him. In, at, at the end of the seventh book, Voldemort kills him. And he comes back to life again. And I don't care what you say, J.K. Rowling, that's a Jesus reference. (laughs) Jesus did it first before Harry Potter. It's the same story. Look, it's the same story, right? Jesus lives the perfect life. He's obedient. He does miracles. And everybody's asking him, are you going to restore the kingdom? Are you going to restore the kingdom? Are you going to restore the kingdom? And then he's crucified, brutally murdered. And we're like, oh, man. And then what happens three days later? The resurrection, the unlooked for hope. This was not expected. He came back to life. We see it in stories all the time, right? If you're keeping up with the Marvel movies, we're actually in the middle of Act 3 right now. Thanos does the snap, and now we're waiting. We're waiting for how, 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 where's the unlooked for hope? What's going to happen, right? What's going to take place? And you see Act 3 in your life a lot. Maybe some of you today are waiting on Act 3. You're in the middle of some brokenness, some hurt. Maybe you don't know Jesus because you're sitting here telling me, Travis, you, you mean to tell me, and I hear this every week, I hear this from a lot of Christians, that, that a peasant who lived 2,000 years ago is supposed to be the answer to my life's problems. And my response to you is, yes, it's ridiculous enough to work. It's the unlooked for hope. That's the story that we're telling you. And it's true. It's real. The crucifixion, the burial, the resurrection had such great ramifications that 2,000 years later, it can still change lives. All you have to do is trust. Remember in Romans 4, it says, Abraham believed God, it was credited to him as righteousness, despite everything else telling him that's not going to happen. I don't know what your life looks like right now. Maybe your marriage is broken and shattered. Maybe you're in a job that you hate. Maybe your kids won't talk to you. Jesus Christ is the answer. Jesus Christ is the unlooked for hope. You come to him and you say, help me. I want to believe in you. I want to trust you. I want to put my faith in you. And then you get rescued by the grace of Christ. And when you put your faith in him, when you stop trying to save yourself, when you stop trying to work your way out of act two on your own, and you let the hero of the story rescue, we're all Disney princesses. You realize that, right? We're not like cool ones like Moana either. We're like Sleeping Beauty, whose contribution to that story was to go to sleep. (laughs) Sorry if she's your favorite princess. She's dead. 
She's waiting on the prince to come and kiss her. Today might be the day for you that the king of kings comes and gives you the kiss of life. If you would just believe and trust. And then when God rescues you, guess what he wants you to do? He wants you to get armed up so you can go and help rescue other people. The unlooked for hope. How amazing would it be if in your marriage that's struggling right now, the person who was wronged, rather than holding that grudge, turns around and says, I forgive you and I love you and I want to work through this. The unlooked for hope. The victim becomes the hero. In your relationship with your child, maybe you come across and you say, look, I'm sorry. I know I've tried to be controlling. And I want to learn how to walk through life with you. The unlooked for hope. The person who lets go of control. Jesus can give that to you today. It's, it's hard. We have to learn. But it can happen. The unexpected hope. And so we find ourselves at the end of Act 3. Things are good. But things get better because there's an Act 4. There's an Act 4. Act 4, God restores. Turn me to Revelation 21. Revelation 21. Some of you just got really excited. You're like, oh, we're talking about Revelation. Yes, we are. Revelation 21, verse 1. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death will be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. Also he said, Write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. In the end, Jesus Christ returns. After the resurrection, Jesus ascended. We're in the church age now, the, the age of the Holy Spirit. One day Christ will return and he'll set right everything that's been broken, everything that's been messed up. And those who have put their faith in him, who have depended on him, right? Who have surrendered all, we sang that. They will reign with Christ in a sort of Garden of Eden 2.0. And rather than, and I know what many of you think, probably many of you have been mistakenly taught, that the hope of the Christian is to die and go to heaven and be this like disembodied spirit that floats around all, all, all for the rest of ever. It's not the hope of the Christian. That's not what the Bible teaches. Yes, we will die. But those in Christ will rise again. When Christ returns, our spirit will be reunited with our body. And then we don't go to heaven. Guess what happens? God in heaven comes to us. And he dwells with his people on earth, in a new heaven, and a new earth. And it's all different kinds of people. Notice it says they will be his people. Remember, what he promises Abraham. He promises to give him a people. And Israel is supposed to be his people. But the thing about Revelation and the thing about this restored future is that his people isn't limited by race or by language or by tribe or by people group or by ethnicity. No. His people includes everybody from all different kinds of people who have trusted in Christ as their Savior. That's what unifies us. That's what brings us all together. And that is so incredibly act four. Think about the end of Return of the Jedi, right? You've got everybody singing and dancing. The Ewoks are dancing. It's great. The cute little teddy bear people. And who do you have there? You have the main heroes. And you have the Ewoks who showed up, kind of an unexpected hope themselves. And you've got all these different aliens kind of running around and celebrating. And then who's presiding over all of this? You've got the ghost of Yoda, the ghost of Obi-Wan. And oh, who's standing there too? Darth Vader or Anakin Skywalker, the redeemed one. Those of us who have broken, who've done, who committed sin, all of us have committed sin. Maybe you think you've done heinous things that nobody can forgive you for. The Bible is a story of redemption and rescue and God wants you there at the end of all things celebrating with him, right? He wants you there. He wants you there for act four because that's when he's gonna set everything right. So I don't know kind of what act four looks like for you today. But what I do know is that we believe at Park Cities in Act 4. We believe it's the hope of the Christian. The hope of the Christian is a resurrected body in a new heaven and a new earth with God living with us, fully clothed in righteousness, no longer ashamed, no longer broken. 
no longer insecure, no longer sinful. That's what we have hope for. There's going to come a point, though, because we believe this, that we have to act. We have to do something. It can't just be a warm fuzzy. And so why, this is why we want to do give up to give. This is why we want some people groups, some four people groups that we've never heard of before, why we want them to have the Bible in their language. Because you know what I want? I want somebody from those four people groups to be in the eternal kingdom with us. I want to hear their story. And you do too. How amazing would it be? The unlooked for hope. There's a people group in trouble. They don't have God's word. But there's a people in Dallas who like lattes and Chick-fil-A. And they decide to give up because they love their Savior and because their Savior, their hero, has delivered them. And so they're back in the battle and they're going to give up things for a month so that they can give to rescue a people group just like their Savior rescued them. How unlooked for hope is this, that a bunch of rich people from Dallas are going to have a hand in the deliverance of a group of people on the other side of the world. Brothers and sisters, you can be the unlooked for hope. Christ through you, rescuing, redeeming. And the story is true. So what I want us to do as we close is I want us to think about our, our four people groups. And what I want us to do is divide into sections. We're already divided into sections. I want us to pray for them. We don't do this much. Maybe we should do it more. But I want us to pray for our people groups. I'm going to give you the names of the people group. Over here, you're going to be the Kong people. You're going to pray for the Kong people. You're going to pray for the Rook people. The section here, the Rook people. This section's going to pray for the Lo people. Lo. And then the far left are the Tre Pura people. And those aren't real names. We're protecting them because they face persecution. That's who you're going to pray for. And I want you to pray in groups. I know that might be awkward or strange. If you're a guest here, guess what? Welcome to the family. You're praying with us. We're going to pray together and pray for these people, and then we'll close. If you want to pray by yourself, you can. But we're praying for a people group, so let's pray together as a people. Pray together. in prayer. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the story that you've given us, the story that's real, the story that we hear and the story that we see in our lives every day. God, we thank you that you've created us. We thank you that after the fall, you haven't left us. Thank you that you've sent your son to redeem us. We thank you that there's a restoration coming and we pray for the Kong, for the Low, for the Rook and for the Trepira people, Lord God pray that you would use the, the gifts that we're able to bring, the things that we give up to bring the gospel to them in their native language, Lord God, in the language that they understand, that their heart language. God, I pray that you would use that. You don't have to use us, Lord God, but you've chosen to. So we thank you for letting us be a part of your story. We love you. In your son's name, amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.